All right, everybody. This is part two of Machiavelli's Discourses. Welcome back. Uh, I already did all the reading. Yeah, the, my first one was up yesterday. But since I already started it, I thought, why not commit to it? Uh, this is another night recording, so there's a 50-50 chance I wake up my kid. So I'll try to be less gregarious than I normally am. If you're, if you're, if you're watching this on the channel, you can really just click on my name, see my other streams. I tend to be about 50% more loud uh, when I'm teaching to a live audience, too. That seems to affect my personality a little bit, which is it's interesting to see that kind of effect. Talking to yourself and talking when you know others are listening live. There's definitely some connection there. But anyway, um, welcome back, everybody. We are going to do Machiavelli's Discourses, Part 2. Now, the parts are completely uh, irrelevant. I'll just keep adding parts the further I go, or I may at some point relabel them as series. But yes, uh, I'm inspired this week, and I feel like the second half of this first chapter are really relevant right now, so I, I really want to cover them. It would be... it's great. I even kind of saw that, what would I say, the... I guess the true part of this, one reason I'm inspired to do it, you can almost... I can kind of see how each side could find points in here. You're like, ah, that's a good source I should be working with. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited, so let's get on in. All right. Um, so, oh, oops. I knew I missed something. One second, folks. Ah, like, I think there's something I'm forgetting. I did not retitle that first slide top. We have new pictures today. I just did not. Uh, I always build on my old slides. It saves about 15 minutes of your life. There we go. That's much better. So we're still in Chapter 1, Best Forms of Government. Um... Yeah, and we left off talking about the Tribune of the Plebs and how the conflict between uh, the Plebs and the Senate, right, the aristocracy and the people, made Ro the Republic free and powerful. Because um, it cleaved towards liberty. So, you know, neither of the classes oppressing each other too much. I should define my terms more, too, considering the time we're in, right? Liberty is, you know, neither of the classes oppressing each other to an extreme. That's what we're talking about here, right? And you're not oppressed by outsiders. Uh, you're able to maintain your freedom as a city-state or a nation. He then asks the, a good question here. He says, I'm going to read his chapter titles. I always paraphrase them on my slides, but uh, I'll read his because they're, they're very interesting. Um, this is uh, subsection 5. Whether the safeguarding of liberty can be more safely entrusted to the populace or to the upper class, and which has the stronger reason of creating disturbances? The haves or the have-nots. It's interesting. So he says, and his intros are always great too, so I have a hard time not reading them. Those who have displayed prudence in consti constituting a republic have looked upon the safeguarding as liberty as one of the most essential things for which they had to provide. And according to the efficiency which this has been done, liberty has been enjoyed for a longer or shorter time. Remember, liberty means the liberty of your people. And it means liberty from outsiders. Both of those are Machiavelli's definition of liberty. And I think it's also a tradi traditional definition of liberty. A, I would say a correct one. Uh, there's also that extra element. Liberty means like freedom with your responsibility, not just freedom, right? It means you have that ability to live from domination. That's what we mean by liberty. It doesn't mean liberality, which is different. All right, so there's now some views here on the answer to this question. Again, what makes Machiavelli great? Uh, he'll always give you um, multiple views, and I think this is a good thing to keep in mind. Um, we're living in a time right now where the European tradition is f under full attack, but it's good to remember, even inside just one tradition, there are a lot of examples you can make from just the pool of that tradition. And this is before you get to other... Um, this is before you get to other traditions, like uh, my discipline at university, I teach a lot of Asian history, and I can find examples for these in Asian history too, which is very, uh, it, it shows that it's a good theory, right? If it can transcend just its time and place, uh, it probably has something true in it. So, all right, so what's the Roman view? And again, remember, as we talked about last time, the Romans are the Italians' guiding light, but in the West in general, they're one of the guiding lights. So... He wants to figure out which of these groups made a better choice. You know, cleaving towards 
the people or cleaving towards the aristocracy. So he says, let us deal with the appeal to reason. Um, it may be urged in support of the Roman view that guardianship of anything should be placed in the hands of those who are less desirous of appropriating it for their own use. So the Romans all thought they should give it to the person who doesn't want to use it. And he says, you ask what the uh, commoners are after, what are the nobility after? Um, nobility generally, let's see. So the nobility, this is to quote him again, uh, it will be seen that the former, the nobility, there is a great desire to dominate, and the latter, the people, merely the desire to not be dominated. And so consequently the latter will be more keen on liberty, since their hope of usurping domi domination over others will be less in the case of the upper class. And then here you go, if you pick them, then they'll be more careful. This is the Roman view. So you, if you give it to the people, they, they can't really usurp it. So they, they just don't want to be dominated instead of trying to dominate others. Now, again, I, this is why Machiavelli is great. He gives both arguments. The counter-argument is presented basically in history by Sparta and Venice. Um, and so the, 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 the people, he says the people who defend Sparta and Venice um, say there's two good results. First, it satisfies their ambition more since with this stick in their hands they play a more important part in the Republic, so should be more contented. And secondly, it prevents the restless minds of the plebs from acquiring a sense of power, which is the cause of endless squabbles and trouble in the Republic. And then they use Rome as an example to basically make this argument, because the plebs did continue to push uh, until the end, although the, the, the conflict between the plebs in the Senate was 300 years straight. That's a pretty long time. It's impressive when you think about it. And then they just he lists all the offices that this push had. Um, so and it's, there's a point here that the plebs are never um, satisfied, right? They pushed forward, they got the tribune, and then they got a censorship. A censor was like a judge in very specific fields. Then they got praetorships and all other offices in the city. And I mean, you can see this in American democracy too, right? Um, uh, re American Republic. Over time, the aristocratic there's been demand for aristocratic roles to become democratic, even when there's no merit. Uh, I mean, look at judges, right? Elected ju judges are basically a shies. If you don't know how it works, like I live in California. In California, there's only one choice. And basically, your only real choice is if you don't vote enough, he just gets reappointed, or somebody does. So, so what are you doing? Like, even if you voted them out, they could just get reappointed. So just shouldn't the politicians just do their job? <clears throat> There's a point to be made there, right? Some things probably shouldn't be abstracted that far. All right. Now he points out what's the consequence of each of these. He doesn't say which one is right right away. He instead says, um, you either you have two choices as a republic. You can either head towards empire or you can focus on status quo. Um, he says, all things being considered, however, and due to the distinctions being made, we shall arrive at the end of this conclusion. Either you have in mind a republic that looks to the founding of an empire, as Rome did, or content with maintaining the status quo. And he mentions this, in the first case, it is necessary to do all the things Rome did. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? In the second case, it is possible to imitate Venice and Sparta, and as he will explain going forward. So you, you have two choices, right? You can choose status quo, so you ma maintenance, basically. Uh, and that's if you give the power to the powerful, you'll, you'll maintain it. Uh, and if you give power to the plebs, over time it will definitely lead to empire. It's just, it's the way of things. And he gives us a big old history lesson here. Um, is there any point I want to make on it? Let's see. I don't think I even... Oh yeah, so I should answer the question, obviously. The haves and the haves-nots. Who causes more disturbances, according to Machiavelli? Uh, he actually, this is interesting, um, he asked it at the end, he says, At the trial, there arose considerable discussion whether the haves or the have-nots were more ambitious, for the appetites of both might actually become the cause of no small disturbance. And he says, actually, however, the disturbances are more often caused by the haves, since the fear of losing what they have arouses in them the same inclination we find in those who want to get more, Uh, and then they say, um, what is this, some psychology here. 
For men are inclined to think that they cannot hold securely what they possess unless they get more at others' expense. And it mentions obviously, right, people who have greater possessions can bring about changes with greater effect or speed. And, and this is what makes it worse. Their corrupt and grasping deportments arouses in the minds of the have-nots the desire to have either revenge for themselves or that they may again share in the riches and honors in regards they deem themselves to have been badly used by the other party. So the haves, the problem with this um, system, basically, right, its conclusion, that if you give the power to the haves, right, the powerful, you're going to just piss off your plebs pretty quick, um... And that's a problem, right? So uh, we, he'll t he talked about it earlier. We're like Venice and Sparta. Actually, no, we're going to talk about it today. They both had uh, reasonable levels of plebs. <laughs> that was how they managed it, right? If you're Rome, you could never do it. So situation ob obviously also matters. All right, great. Let me sip my coffee. And we'll keep going. And uh, I think this is a, a basically true principle of... And I think we'll talk about it today where everything's a trade-off. Let me see if we talk about that today. Oh, yeah, that's the next chapter. We'll talk about it. He's so logical. I sometimes like, should I repeat a thing I just read or is it coming up? With Machiavelli, it's almost always coming up. He has that early, modern, late medieval mindset where they don't leave anything hanging. They try to build a very elaborate structure. And uh, he might be one of the better political thinkers of all time, uh, in my opinion, if you take all his works together. And I think it's why nobody reads him anymore. He's a little too accurate. All right. So then the question becomes whether in Rome such a form of government could have been set up as it would have removed hostility between the populace and the Senate. Because that's a counter-argument, right? He's saying there's a lot of virtue that came from this. Um, so how could you have done this if you wanted to get rid of controversy? Historians love to hit Rome for this specifically. Um, so what kind of strategies could we enact if we wanted to do it? Well. He gets into Sparta, this is where I mentioned already, but I'll, I'll re-mention it. He gets into Sparta and Venice examples. Um, Sparta set up a king and a small senate. Venice um, basically excluded new people. <laughs> That's how they kept their, their safe. So Venice's broad solution was keeping outsiders out of, from the political system. Um, They decided all newcomers who meant to reside there should not take part in the government. Then, in the new course, they found that there were quite a number of inhabitants of the place who were disbarred from government. Oops. And, but how could the Venetians maintain it? They didn't give representation. Well, this is interesting. Um, so people, this is, uh, they, let me see this here, so. So people, basically people who moved to Venice after it had been founded, they couldn't complain because they weren't from there originally. In addition, um, they found the form of government firmly established. So the opportunity to cause emotion was pretty low, but most importantly, they had no cause because they'd been deprived of nothing, right? They moved to Venice. They, didn't, they didn't, weren't deprived of anything. They were gaining. And they had no opportunity because the government had the whip hand and did not employ them in matters of which would enable them to acquire authority. Um, and the, the way to say this, what it means is specifically, the Venetians didn't use non-citizens in their armies. Uh, so they, they never like called them up in war or anything. So it managed to keep them pacified. And there was never too many of them. Uh, Sparta, on the other hand, just didn't let anybody in. <laughs> and he says, uh, Sparta had a king and a small senate to maintain, maintain itself the way it was for a long time. Uh, because there were few inhabitants and access to outsiders desirous of coming to dwell there was forbidden. <laughs> so how did Sparta maintain it 800 years? Uh, no migration. <laughs> That's how they did it, right? So limited, if you're Venice, Right, you, you exclude out, out, uh, newcomers from the political system, and then you don't let many in. And again, uh, he'll talk about geography in a little bit. But Venice is designed with size limitations built into the design. And Sparta, it was built into the law. They just didn't allow foreigners to migrate. All right. 
Now, what about Rome? We're talking about these three, right? We're comparing them all. Um, and he says, all things considered, therefore, it is clear that it was necessary for Rome's legislators to do one of two things if Rome was to remain tranquil, like of the aforementioned states, Venice and Sparta. Um, they either had to not employ the plebs in war, like the Venetians, or, like the Spartans, not admit foreigners. Rome did both of those things, and by so doing, gave it to the plebs alike strength, increase, and endless opportunities for commotion. And they mentioned too, this is the thing, if Rome had chosen not to do that, um, it, they would have lost inconvenience, but they would have been weaker. Because it would have cut out the source of supply, which enabled to acquire greatness, which arrived. So the cause for expansion would have also been the cause for what made them strong. So then he points out here, this is a, one of his best points I've read so far in this book. In human affairs, it is impossible to remove one inconvenience without another appearing, right? Unintended consequences. Every time you make, you remove something, another thing happens, and you don't know what it is, right? So, so if you want to have a large population, any of the houses relevant to us, right? If you want to have a large population and provide it with arms as to establish a great empire, you have to make your population such that you cannot now handle it as you please. <laughs> this again, does this sound familiar? Uh, like a country. Okay, you're starting to copy Rome more and more, right? Uh, now, interestingly enough, um, making United States jokes, the United States was originally patterned more on Sparta. Um, but it's it's become Rome, which is an interesting, in, in a Machiavellian sense, right? I'm not endorsing either one right now, but I'm pointing out that is the transition, right? It's more of a Venice-Sparta, and it's now more of a Rome in the 21st century. Um, we can blame World War II for that. Uh, Europeans, try not to destroy yourselves next time. I guess now I have to talk to the Asians. The Europeans are already twilighting. Asians, please don't have a giant mega war and then force us to be the superpower again, thanks. All right, now he points out here a couple other things. Um, while if you keep it either small or unarmed, to do oh, so you'll be able to manage it and then acquire dominions either you will lose hold of it your people or it will become so debased you'll be at the mercy of anyone who attacks you so if you're trying to have fewer inconveniences you basically can't expand all right so then when you're establishing a city this is kind of advice should then anyone be about to set up a republic he should first inquire whether to expand as rome did both in dominion and power or so be confined to narrow limits. Oof, this is a hard one, right? So you have to decide what is your ambition. Uh, this is actually, there's, there's, there's um, echoes of this in the modern times, too. Uh, in the late 19th century, when the Japan was quote-unquote opened and it was starting to westernize, uh, modernize, I should say, they went to Europe and they realized there is two tiers of powers, even in the 19th century. There's the what they call like porcupine powers, the ones who just set up really strong defenses, uh, but never expanded, and then the colonial powers. And they had to pick which one they wanted to be. So this was still obvious uh, late 19th century as well. And again, I think it's it's obvious enough to be a truism. These are basically your two choices. And remember, there's an underlying principle here that if you ever read The Prince, it's also there. Um, no kingdom, republic, principality can be a republic, kingdom, or principality if it cannot defend itself. Because once you can't defend yourself, you are de facto subjected to someone else. Your own defense is critical to be in the contention here, right? You have to be a republic, you have to be free and not subjugated. It's also very interesting, so something to connect all of this together. Now, long-lasting, if you want to last as long as Sparta and Venice, by the way, Venice literally went from fall of Rome, and remember, Rome didn't fall overnight if we don't read just Protestant history or Whig history. Rome fell between 400 and 700. So by 700, Venice became a city. From 700 to 1800, Venice was independent. What happened in 1800? Napoleon. Um, Napoleon invaded everywhere and ended a lot of old empires, including Venice. But they got 900 years and Sparta got 800 years. So, but if you want to do a Sparta or Venice and you're, firm, you're founding a new city, and as we talked about last time, right, um, these kind of city foundations are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
Um, it's assuming you're either setting up in a location or you're moving there as like expatriates. Uh, he says, I'm firmly convinced, therefore, that to set up a republic, which is to last a long time, the way to set about it is to constitute Sparta or Venice were constituted, to place in a strong position, so to fortify it, so no one will dream of taking it by sudden assault. By the way, this is why nobody ever likes flat plains or uh, river entrances that aren't easily defended. Modern cities are insane from a war perspective. Um, and they say, on the other hand, do not make it so large as to appear formidable to its neighbors. <laughs> right? Don't be too scary either. Um, and then it can join its government for a long time. It says, war is made on a commonwealth for two reasons. Then remember, this is a free republic slash commonwealth. To subjugate it or for fear of being subjugated by it. And if you take the two precautions, he said, then those won't be issues. So you don't have to be impossible to take, you have to be difficult to take. And if you know anything about historical sieges, not easy. Even modern technology, uh, sieges and city fights are horrible. So, um, generally speaking, not a bad call here. Now, there's another point he makes while tying all this together, because he is trying to like explain why the status quo is a choice. Um, you have to keep this in mind. Since, however, all human affairs are ever in a state of flux and cannot stand still, for the traditionalists of you out there, this is good to keep in mind, either there will be improvement or decline, and necessity will lead you to do many things which reason does not recommend. Right, and uh, we're, we, we live in times where people are get really mad at armchair internet quarterbacks. And this is fair, right? You're never standing still. Uh, I would say this is so true, it's even dating advice, right? If you're, if you're not getting better or worse, you're getting worse. Does that make sense? Like, there is no neutral in reality. Um, so hence, how do we apply this to a commonwealth, though? Hence, in a commonwealth, be constituted with a view to its maintaining the status quo, but not with a view to expansion, and by necessity it will be led to expand, its basic principles will be subverted, and it will be faced with ruin. He said, even if heaven is so kind it doesn't need to go to war, then it will come about idleness will enter the effeminate and give rise to factions and bring its downfall. So there has to be some method to have improvement. Uh, how did the Venetians do it? Well, the Venetians actually uh, were traders, and... Uh, they were famous world traders, but they on and off would conquer too much and then lose it. The Spartans were famous warriors, right? So the trade kind of kept the Venetians expanding and wealthy, and then the the warfare kept the Spartans improving. Uh, they were finally defeated by the Romans, actually, so it took a really long time. They also had a semi-empire where they fought the Athenians and won, actually. Uh, but then a guy named Alexander the Great showed up, and uh, yeah, it didn't go well for them. Technically, they lost to him, too. All right. And then finally, I love this one. In the, in the modern day, this week, this is one reason I had to do this this week. Moderate positions are impossible. He says, wherefore, since it is impossible, so I hold, to adjust the balance so nicely as to keep things exactly to, to this middle course, one ought to, in constituting a republic, to consider the possibility of this playing a more honorable role. And so to constitute that should necessarily actually force it to expand. It may be able to retain possession of what it has acquired. So, you can't stand still. He points out, um, I'm convinced the Roman type of constitution should be adapted. That no any, any other form of republic for what to find a middle way between the two extremes, I do not think possible. You basically have to be Sparta or Rome. You know, Venice or Rome. There's not a middle round. He's a squabbles between the populace and the Senate should, therefore, be looked upon as con uh, inconvenience, which is necessary to put up with in order to arrive at greatness of Rome. Oof. So, uh, not that easy to uh, make your choice here. And Machiavelli falls on the Roman side. If you're curious, he lived in the time of city-states and was an advocate for Roman or uh, Italian unity. Did not happen in his life. They got invaded by a lot of outsiders. It's too bad. Uh, all right, the next two. Uh, again, this all feels very relevant in a contemporary sense. If any of this rhymes, man, welcome to history. Uh, okay, this next section, I'm going to read it and then explain it. How necessary public indictments are for the maintenance of liberty in a republic. 
So this is basically you need to indict people who harm the liberty of your state. So you put the court. You have to have courts of some type that punish anything against the freedom of the republic. Okay, and then remember this is the anything against that keeps the republic free, both from each any faction inside of it, um, completely dominating the other, and more importantly from foreign uh, domination. He says no authority is more useful and necessary that can be granted to those appointed to look after liberties of a state than that of being able to indict before the people or some magistrate or court such citizens have committed any offense preju prejudicial to the freedom of the state. Oof. So why would you do that? First, fear of being prosecuted, citizens will attempt nothing prejudicial to the state. And then secondly, um, there's an outlet for bad feelings about people, basically. So nothing does more so much to stabilize and strengthen republic as some institution whereby the changeful humors which agitate it are afforded a proper outlet by the way of laws. And so this is critical to maintain a republic. Um, and he, he thinks without it you cannot you survive. You can't. If, if, if people act in a way that injures the, the integrity and the freedom of your republic and you do nothing, uh, the republic will die de facto. And remember, uh, he already explained the type of government. When a republic dies, um, unless you immediately found a new one, you're going to get foreign subjugation. That's actually what you get. Uh, welcome to history, everybody. All right. Now, next one. He uh, then says... Um, do I want to read this? Oh, yeah. So there needs to be a special forum, basically, for public indictments against the freedom. It can't be just a normal legal system. He points that out because it's basically, it'll lead to the downfall of civil liberties. So you need to have, like, a separate system of justice for this to function well. Uh, what else do I want here? He mentions Florence didn't have this, and it's one thing that took down Florence in history. Um... So then, like, somebody who does that something unconstitutional, uh, there was no way resisting save by forming a rival party, and it came to began to collect supporters and defend himself. He had nothing to be afraid of unless extraordinary steps were taken. So suddenly you make two parties, then you're fighting in the streets, right? Uh, and then your, your republic's gone. So you need some outlet to punish harming the, the, the maintenance of the system you've built, especially if it's a just republic. That's, you know, kind of the... Point. Now, the opposite, too, needs to be pointed out. I want to use my definition software one second. Oh, where are you? Here we go. Okay, oh, that's all my summa theology stuff. Okay. Oh, I'm not typing. Here, let me type it over here. This word is so old, I have to show you guys. Okay. This one is calumnies are also injurious. Calumny, slander, false accusations of a crime or offense, knowingly or maliciously made or reported to the injury of another, false representation of facts reproachful to another, made by design and with knowledge of its falsehood, sometimes followed on. The calumny. This is a great old word we need to bring back. Calumnies are equally injurious to the freedoms of the Republic, by the way. And, um... He gives an example from Rome, where uh, a famous Roman was, there was just a rumor, a false rumor about him, and it took him down and destroyed him. And that can destroy a republic, right? So, you have to be really wary of allowing false rumors to not be punished. Um, and for him, he's a big, he's really against it. Um... It's clear from the incident, this Roman incident, where they just threw this guy away completely unjustly. It was just a rumor started by his enemy. Um, that, let's see here, it says, uh, the detestation of calumnies should be held in free cities and all other forms of society, not just free cities. And how, with a view to checking them, no institution which serves this end should be neglected, nor for their prevention. Can there be anything better than an institution which provides adequate faculties for charges to be brought because indictments are helpful to republics as calumnies are to harmful? And what's the problem? The problem, the reason calumny is so bad, right, rumor milling and false information about a public figure, there's no need of witnesses or any other corroboration for the facts 
that said calumny is going so that anybody can be calumniated by anybody else. It's completely unjust. Where there's no burden of proof. It's all an echo chamber. So for him, he thought they should be severely punished. Now, um, why? Right? Oh, it's freedom of speech. Oh my god. Uh, well, calumny is a way to seize power. That's why. Cal calumnies, too, are among various things which citizens have availed themselves in order to acquire greatness and are very effective when employed against powerful citizens who stand in the way of one's plans. It's, it's, a, it's a proven historical method to subvert the f liberty in a republic. Uh, if you can't make modern connections to this, I'm not going to do it for you. I'm going to let you be creative. But in Rome, this was very common. And when it was misused, it could destroy people. Because Rome was an honor society. Uh, honor was more important than money. We are definitely in a materialist society right now, where how much you have matters. Rome was how much honor you had. That's all that mattered. So losing your reputation to calumny was the most injurious thing that could happen to a Roman. Although I'd argue probably also modern Italians is probably still a big deal, right? They're very big on defending their masculinity and their manliness, because that is also honor. So, calumnies are also injurious. Now, we live in a calumny-free time, which means people are allowed to do this as much as they like. And uh, Machiavelli would say, uh, for surely a mistake. All right. Oh, man, this next one's great. Okay, so now we're kind of hit the... We're hitting the stride of this chapter. We're getting towards the end. This last section, I'm going to read it to you at the title and then explain it a little bit. It is that it is necessary to be a sole authority if one would constitute a republic afresh or would reform it thoroughly regardless of its ancient institutions. So it would, um, he said it would appear to some, oh, it will appear strange that I have got so far into my discussion of Roman history without having made any mention of the founders of the Republic or either of its religious or military institutions. Hence, that I may not keep mind those who are anxious to hear about such things any longer in suspense, let me say that many perchance will think it a bad precedent that the founder of a civic state such as Romulus should first have to kill his brother and then have um, acquiesced to the death of Titus Tatus, the Sabine, whom he had chosen as his colleague in the kingdom. So, people immediately will argue against picking a sole authority. By the way, the subtitle at the top of my page here says Autocracy Essential to Reform. Now, why? Well, first, you almost always need this. And he says here, one should take a general rule that rarely, if ever, ever, does it happen that a state, whether to be a republic or a kingdom, what either well-ordered at the outset or radically transform vis-a-vis -vis its old institutions, unless this is to be done by one person. And it says, it is likewise essential there should be but one person upon whose mind and method depends any similar process of organization. And he says this, um, Wherefore, the prudent organizer of state whose intentions is to govern, not in his own interests, but for the common good, and not in the interests of his successors, but for the sake of the fatherland, which is common to all, should contrive to be alone as an authority. So, um... Sorry, I went a little too far ahead there. Uh, but So this person should be singular. And this is interesting too. Nor will any reasonable man blame him for taking any action, however extraordinary, which may be of service in the organizing of a kingdom or the constituting of a republic. And um, it's a sound maxim. I already put this up. Reprehensible actions may be justified by their effects. And that when the effect is good, as we talked about Romulus, it always justifies the action. So Romulus the founder of Rome killed his brother to have a better foundation. So the principle, like that, you know, the killing is bad, but it was for the constituting of a just republic that lasted 2,000 years. So Machiavelli would say a worthy action. So sometimes men must do reprehensible actions. And this is, this is why Machiavelli is not a moralist. He's a very moral man, but he, he studies history and he runs into the fact sometimes you have to do actions that a, like a purist wouldn't necessarily advocate for. And he says, For it is the man who uses violence to spoil things, not the man who uses it to mend them, that is blameworthy. Because there is, uh, remember, we talked about his ethics as being Catholic. There's a, there's a movement in Catholicism where all violence is condemned. Uh, 
the problem with that, of course, is the Old Testament exists and God exists. But violence itself isn't unethical, right? If you use violence to mend things, it's, it's praiseworthy violence. All right. Uh, another really interesting point here, though, the organizer of a state ought to further to have sufficient prudence and virtue not to bequeath the authority he had assumed on any other person. For seeing that men are more prone to evil than good, his successor might well make ambitious use of what he had used virtuously. So once you reform a system, you got to cut the legs out of your own power before you give it to someone else. So you reform it, you make it, you recon either reconstitute it or make a new one. You have to you have to like knock the ladder out from under you before you die, right? So you have to reorganize it and then submit yourself to all the laws you made so that, that you start the tradition. And then if it's a good tradition, it will sustain itself. But the foundational point is here. Any good system almost always needs one core founder. They're not alone, right? But one person has... You have to have a Washington, right? You have to have that one eminent figure. You know, there has to be a king or an emperor. There has to be a Caesar, right? Even the transition from uh, republic to uh what's the word i'm looking for republic to empire rome had a singular figure right now what did what could you argue caesar didn't do right uh he didn't institute the system well which he could have done but he was stabbed <laughs> so you know sometimes you have to do a little work uh so there's an indirect critique of caesar here which i find hilarious all right, any other points I want to make here? He gives lots of examples of this from history. He talks about Romulus. Um, uh, he talks about Solon, Moses, people he's already talked about several times. But basically, to really say, you need one person's vision, basically. Now, on the flip side, though, and I love this, he, he, he's even-handed. He also talks about tyrants, right? And it's an indictment of tyranny, based tyranny, sorry. So, those who set up a, tyran a tyranny are less no less blameworthy than the founders of a republic or a kingdom praiseworthy. And then to start it off, he says, of all men that are praised, those who are praised most, who have played the chief part in founding a religion. Next come those who have founded either republics or kingdom. After them, in the order of uh, celebrates, are ranked army commanders who have added to the extent of which their own dominions and to that of their countries. And then he says, next is learned man, um some praise for men at art or the practice of it and then he says on the other hand um, it'll those who are held infamous and detestable who extra, extirpate religions kill them subvert kingdoms and republics make war on virtue on letters and on any art that brings advantage and honor to the human race i.e. the profane the violent the ignorant the worthless the idle the coward uh, nor will there ever be anyone be he foolish or wise, wicked or good, who, if called upon to choose between the two classes of men, will not praise the one who calls for praise and blame the one that calls for blame. And again, this is where you see the Christian ethics coming out, right? Um, tyranny is obviously corruption, right? Uh, let's see, finally. Uh... And yet, notwithstanding this, almost all men deceived by false semblance of good and the false semblance of renown allow themselves to either willfully or ignorantly slip into the ranks of those who deserve blame rather than praise. So when given a chance, many men will be take the tyrant option. <sighs> and, he, and he gives lots of examples of this, which is depressing. But he gives examples of acting well also. He says, uh, let he from whom becomes a prince of a republic consider. So how do we avoid this? After Rome became an empire... How much more praise is due to those emperors who acted like good princes in accordance with the laws than those who acted otherwise. So even if you have absolute power, act in accordance with the laws. Remember I mentioned that the founder of a dynasty, like a founder of a republic, had to be a good founder actually has to submit himself to the law. So the, the founder would make them then submit it. But any other subsequent prince, to be a just good prince that's commendable, has to willful even though he has the power to subvert the laws he submits himself to the laws as respect to the system um, and he says if the history of these emperors is pondered well it should serve as a striking lesson to any prince and should teach him to distinguish between the ways of renown and the ways of infamy the ways of security and the ways of fear 
and then he gives a bunch of uh, Roman history examples. Uh, I'm not going to go into literally all of these. But he gives some positive examples too. So let Prince put before himself a period of Nerva to Marcus, who is Marcus Aurelius, by the way, and let him compare it with the preceding period and which came after, and let him decide in which he would rather have been born, during which he would have chosen to be emperor. What, will, oh, what he will find when good princes are ruling is a prince securely reigning among his subjects, no less secure. Um, I want to, I forgot to click my slides, but yeah, here we go. Let's see. A world replete with peace and justice. He will see a senate's authority respected, magistrates honored, rich citizens enjoying their wealth, nobility and virtue held in the highest esteem, everything working smoothly and going well. He will notice, on the other hand, the absence of any rancor, any licentiousness, corruption, or ambition, and that in his old golden age for everyone is free to hold and to defend his own opinion. He will behold, in short, the world triumphant, its prince glorious and respected by all, the people fond of him and secure under his rule. So, again, we're back to that human, why are we studying history? What's the point? How do you apply this theory to history? This is it, right? You need to study the good and bad examples and follow those good ones. Now, obviously, if there's a prince, the prince has to figure out, is he in a foundation age or is he in a sustain age, right? Is he a Marcus or is he a Caesar or is he a uh, Romulus? Like, historical timing also matters if one is ever in these situations, right? But... Again, why was that a good description I just read? Why why would that zing with some people? There's proportion, right? There's justice. There's uh, peace in the land because people are actually contented, right? The people with their wealth are happy with it. The regular people aren't starving and they're you know they're living a decent life, right? There's this need for balance. And then it does this final sale here. Um, there can be no question that every human being will be afraid to imitate the bad times and will be imbued with an ardent desire to emulate the good. And should a good prince seek a worldly renown, he should most certainly covet possession of a city which is, that has become corrupt, not with Caesar to complete its spoliation, but with Romulus to reform it. Nor, in very truth, can the heavens afford men a better opportunity of acquiring renown, nor can men desire anything better than this. And if, in order to reform a city, one were obliged to give up the principate, Someone who did not reform it in order to fall from the t rank would have some excuse. There is, however, no excuse if one can keep both the Principate and reform a city. So he, I have to read his conclusion, then we'll conclude here. In conclusion, then, let those whom the heavens grant such opportunities reflect that two courses are open to them, either so to behave that in life they rest secure and in death become renowned, or so to behave that in life they are continu in continual straits, and in death leave behind an imperishable record of their infamy. So there you go, man. There's two choices there. Ooh, for best government. And I don't even know how I can add to that. That's amazing. But that's kind of the sales pitch of what I want to do here with this book. Uh, as I get more comfortable with this format, I'll try to integrate more of the context I know. Um, I did it today pretty good, I think. And a lot of that's part of the process of like reflection and kind of understanding what I'm doing. But uh, I want to thank you all for watching this. Uh, I had a good time doing it. Uh, I want to keep going. I, I think I will. That's as much as I've read up to now recently. I've read this book before, but I'm rereading it for teaching, which is much more elaborate notes. Um, but yeah, I think I'll keep going. Uh, we're in an interesting season where I think this book is very relevant. So I want to try putting out a couple of weeks as I can, depending on my grading schedule and uh, life and kids. I think I just woke up my son, too, so i got to go put him to sleep. But uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, have a great night, and I'll uh, see you on the next one.